Christ the Redeemer Catholic Church in Thibodeau, Louisiana welcomes you to our celebration of the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. The following homily was recorded live on Sunday, November 16th, 2014, as Father Mark Toops concludes our series on the seasons of life. Today's message, part six of six, focuses on the seasons of waiting. As always, we welcome you to join us here at Christ the Redeemer and experience our family. Until we see you, know that God is with you no matter what season in life you're in. Now, Father Mark. Well, good morning again. Good to have you here this morning. And I uh, can't believe Thanksgiving is already around the corner. Believe it or not, just a week and a half away, we will be uh, inching into the holiday season. And I'm sure by now that you and your family have either begun conversations about Thanksgiving or perhaps are already well into plans of where you're going to be and who you're going to be with and what you're going to be doing. Uh, my family has uh, decided on the island. We will be in Grand Isle for Thanksgiving and uh, looking forward to that. The fishing ought to be off the chart and if the weather cooperates, it ought to be a, a blast just to be with them and, and not only do some fishing, but just some hanging out. I'm sure a lot of eating and a lot of laughing and just uh, a chance for us to be together. And uh, I can't tell you how thankful I am to be uh, in that space and place with them for Thanksgiving uh, because there's a lot to be thankful for. And um, I, I've shared with you that this, uh, this past year and a half with you as, as a member of this family, as, as pastor here at Christ Redeemer, has been like the, the most amazing like year and a half of my life. It's been the best stretch of my priesthood. I've never been happier and so much to be thankful for because of you. And, and just when I thought that it couldn't get any better, just when I thought that God could not be outdone in generosity, I got an email from, uh, from one of my brothers about two months ago, just expressing his own desire for God. Now, I had been praying for a long time. Um, he's a great man. I have amazing respect for him. He's, he's probably one of the heroes in my life and very much a father figure to me when I was younger. And I can't tell you the influence that he has had in my life and just the respect that I have for him. I think he's a man who embodies virtue. He's probably one of the nicest guys uh, on the planet. And, um, and he and I have just different ways of expressing our relationship with God, where, you know, I might be the more traditional churchgoer, especially on the weekend. I go to Mass a lot on the weekends. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, he, where as he may not go to church as much as I go to church or may not have the same vocabulary for God, I, I know that he very much believes in God, but... Um, I have been praying for a long time for um, there to just kind of be a breakthrough in his heart and a breakthrough in his life and, and just really filled with gratitude this year for, for a conversation that he and I had about two months ago, a conversation uh, that started through email and then kind of carried into more personal context about uh, like his desire for God, his desire for more of God in his life and like this just beautiful desire for him to believe in God, not because of, like my mom and my dad said we have to believe, but because he wants to believe and his desire like to learn more about the Bible, to learn more about God and God's word. So when that window opened up, like I immediately walked through it and for the last, I don't know, maybe five or six weeks, we've been in a Bible study together. Uh, he and his wife and his, his, his son and, and myself just kind of all walking together, learning together and it has been just an amazing experience of grace for me in my life and just very thankful to God for it. I get thankful because it had been something that I had been praying for for a long time. I pray for my siblings every day by name, pray for all their children by name. And, and you might say I've just been waiting a long time for a breakthrough like this to, to very naturally and on God's timing unfold in his life. And for that waiting came through and, and, and God came through. It was, it was the grace to wait, but there's obviously something that God is doing uh, in his life. And, and I'm just filled with a lot of gratitude this Thanksgiving. Because sometimes you have to wait, huh? You know, that's my brother, and I love him dearly, and 
like I can, I can see your eyes right now. I can see that as I talk about my own brother, that, that many of you know perhaps what it's like to wait for somebody in your life who you love, for, for them to, like to come around in their relationship with God. Maybe you have sons and daughters or maybe your grandkids who, who you raised, quote, unquote, Catholic. They went to Catholic school. They raised them Catholic and like they no longer go to church or or maybe you, you know, and I, I say this with great reverence, maybe it's a spouse where like your spouse like stopped coming to church or you started coming to church and they, they, didn't, they didn't make that turn with you. And gosh, I know that a lot of us know what it's like to wait on God to, to move in other people's lives. But like just flying up to 30,000 feet, like and looking at the big picture of life, I think we all know what waiting is like, regardless of what you're waiting for. Like, we, we've all waited. Like, we, we go through seasons in life. And last six weeks, we've talked about lots of different things. Like, week one, we talked about what seasons are. Then we moved into the season of blessing. We talked to God that sometimes you go through a season where you're just really stretched. Sometimes you're in a season of letting go. Sometimes you're in a season of struggle. And sometimes you're in a season of waiting. Let me give you some examples of, of what the season of waiting looks like. And, and just think about your life. Think about where you've been. Think about perhaps where you are now. Think about the people that you love the most. Let me just share with you some examples of how we go through a season of waiting in our life. And, and just start to see if some of this kind of maybe gives words to your own experience. It's built right there in your life. Like, so for example, we just talked about we can wait for somebody to come back in their relationship with God. We can also wait for people who are struggling to, uh, to kind of land on their feet. Like you might have somebody in your life or maybe there have been seasons in your life where the people that you love the most have really just gone through a dark valley. It could be with uh, addiction, it could be with uh, finances, it could be professionally, it could be in their marriage with their kids, it could be with their health. But when, when somebody that you love is struggling and you can wait with them, but man, you just, you're, you just want so much for them to really like to turn that corner. Yeah, you give you another example and, and I kind of alluded to it just now, but sometimes in marriages, Spouses have to wait for each other. You know, I see it all the time. You have, um, you have two people who, who get married. They enter into that beautiful sacrament and covenant with each other. And in there, they're, they're, they're at a certain level, you might say, of a relationship with God. And all of a sudden, here comes the Holy Spirit, moves in one of their lives, and one of the spouses is just like starting to grow spiritually. And then there's a grief that I think can pop up in their hearts as they have to wait for the other spouse to catch up with them. You might say, you know, or like they, they want to spend more time in the Word of God. They want to spend more time, quote, unquote, at church. And like the other spouse doesn't understand that. It, it's new. They, they didn't have that touch of the Holy Spirit. And so spouses sometimes need to wait on the other spouse. Well, of course, we wait on God. How many times are we waiting on him? Waiting on God to answer our prayers. And I just shared the example of how long had, had I prayed. I know my mom has been praying like forever for all of her kids. And like maybe you have asked God for something and, and maybe you know what it's like to wait on him to quote unquote finally come through or to give us the thing that we've been begging for. Or maybe you know what it's like to wait for somebody else's prayer to get answered. You know, a, a family that, that, that's longing to have another child and they, they've been begging God for the gift of conception and, and like you're waiting with them as, as they see if that's going to happen. Somebody gets sick and, 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 and you're watching them kind of go through their sickness and they've asked God for something and you're waiting for God to bless them with the answer to that prayer. But like we can wait with other people while God is is involved in their life or of course a lot of times we can wait and we can just wonder where are you god in the midst of the waiting you know 
That's happened to me a whole lot of times as I've waited on my siblings. I've waited on people like um, in my li- life. I've, I've waited on, on you and, and, and really praying for you. And I just want to know where are you in those moments? And, and so sometimes we're, we're waiting on God to show us where he is in that, in that dark valley, you might say, of Psalm 23. Some more examples, just to kind of really add flesh to it. You know, you can wait for a door to open or you can wait for a door to close. Could be at work, could be financially, could be with a house or a move or a new school for the kids, or it could be for just an opportunity for you, or, or maybe you want to move on, but you can't until like a door closes. But we can, we can wait for doors to open or close. Certainly relationally, we can wait for someone to forgive us. You know, I think so many times we live in the, in the wake of our own decisions. And, and sometimes, I have, I've been the first to say it, that, that my life, that, that our lives, like we hurt other people. And as we come to that awareness or we see the, the, the path of our own destruction sometimes, we have to wait for people to forgive us. Or finally, we can wait on news that affects our lives, like, like nothing longer than that waiting period where you're waiting for the test results for, for something medically, right? Or you're waiting for a decision that somebody else is going to make that's going to dramatically affect either your life or the life of someone that you love. So you see, like if you look at it, like uh, so many of these, that, like you can say, yeah, that makes sense, or yeah, that hits home, or yeah, that connects to my life. Like so many of these examples, you can see that we all go through seasons of waiting. And the reason why I think it's important for us just to kind of lean into this this morning is because I think there's three common responses to waiting. You know, sometimes there's anxiety as you're waiting on someone or something. There's a lot of just anxiety. There's worry. Your mind just kind of rolls and it just kind of lives in the pit of your stomach and it can affect your sleep, it can affect your irritability, it can affect so many things, just the, the angst, the anxiety of waiting. Of course, there's impatience. Sometimes we just get impatient either with God or with the process or with other people or ourselves. But a lot of times that waiting, like we can just get impatient and we just want it to hurry up and we just want it to end. And of course, with those two things, we can also get tired. There can be a fatigue that enters into the waiting. The question for us this morning is, like, what if, like, what if we didn't have to struggle in the wait anymore? Like, and I think, like, some of us are there today, right? Like, what if it, it was easier? Or what if there was hope? What if there was light? What if waiting didn't have to be so difficult? And what if God could speak a word to us today about just the whole process of waiting? Because I think a lot of that has to do with how we wait and, and who shows us how to wait and just the example of the saints that gives us encouragement about the season of waiting. No, none other than St. Paul, who offers incredible, I think, example for us in the whole process of waiting. St. Paul wrote the, his, uh, his great letter to the Thessalonians, and we read 1 Thessalonians today in the, in the second reading. If you want to go with me, it's on page 58 in the Missalette. Page 58 at the bottom right there, we pick up 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Again, that's going to be on page 58 in the Missalette. So as St. Paul is writing today, page 58, the first line that we see right there, he says, Concerning times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need for anything to be written to you. St. Paul acknowledging that there are times and seasons in life. And so as we have been in this six-week pilgrimage together about the seasons of life, St. Paul saying for us right there that we go through different seasons. And 
See, Paul knew what those seasons were like, especially the season of waiting. He says for us, look at that middle paragraph there. He says, when people are saying peace and security, then a sudden disaster comes upon them like labor pans upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. What's he talking about there? I think a lot of times we look at the scriptures and like a lot of times it just seems foreign to us. Well, look at the sentence right before it. He says, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So he is pointing to, of course, the, the end times. He's pointing to the second coming. He's talking to, about the end of the world, about the, the coming of Christ to bring all things into fulfillment. And so, of course, then, when he's, he's, he then leans into the sentence, when people are saying peace and security, then sudden disaster will come upon them. He's, he's, he's pointing to the end times there. And he's doing so, St. Paul actually lived in expectation that the second coming was coming. That, that St. Paul was waiting for the second coming in a certain way. He was waiting for the coming of Christ to be brought into fulfillment. He was a man who was waiting. But St. Paul, in his waiting, is not a man who is uh, passively stagnant. He's a man who shows us how we are to wait when you and I are in that season. It's even brought beautifully back to one of the readings from the, the daily masses this past week as St. Paul finds himself in prison and he's in jail. He's probably waiting for the end of his life or he's waiting for um, some judge to make a decision about his life. He's certainly waiting to get out of jail. St. Paul waiting, and he's not filled with anxiety. He's not filled with impatience. He's not filled with fatigue. What's he doing in jail? St. Paul in prison actually fathers Onesimus. He, he shares the faith with a, a, a runaway slave who he brings into relationship with Jesus Christ. He mentors him. He disciples Onesimus, brings him into relationship with God. St. Paul is waiting in prison, certainly waiting for the end of the world. St. Paul, a man who's waiting, he is actively engaged with God during the wait. And God bears fruit in his life, changes the life of this guy, Onesimus, continues to change St. Paul's life in the wait. Now, man, what if your life could be that anointed when you're waiting? Like, what if there was more for you, not after God finally answered the prayer, but what if your life could be blessed and full of grace, if you could be happy, if you could be filled with abundance during the wait? Would you want that? Because the invitation for us today is to not be afraid of the waiting. Don't be afraid of seasons of waiting because they can be filled with a powerful grace. Three things for us today that if we kind of lean into, they can give us encouragement about what we can do this week together. But let's just for a second kind of unpack what's our posture as, a, as Christians in the, in the season of waiting. Number one, I want us to believe that God is active in the wait even when we can't see it. Let me give you an example. So here I am, and I'm praying every day for my brother who I love like a, like, a, like a brother. I love him dearly. And I have this image of what it's going to be like when he has his breakthrough with God, whenever God moves in his life. I have this image of what it's going to look like over here. And I'm over here, and I'm looking at what I think this is going to look like when God moves in his life. And I miss all of this. See, I'm not in his life when he's in the field as a surveyor just kind of thinking about life or I'm not with him when he's, he's in his office and he's listening to Christian music or I'm not in his world whenever he's just kind of pondering things at night. See, I don't, I don't see any of that. So as I'm waiting for the answer to that prayer, I'm locked in on what I think the first sign of God's movement is going to be in his life and I miss all of the hidden stuff. So like if you're waiting on somebody to experience a breakthrough or if you're waiting for God to do something in your life and it affects other people, or if you're just waiting on God to answer a prayer, you actually might be blind to what God is doing in the hidden. 
So you see God's moving. He's heard your prayer. He is, he is actively engaged in the very thing that you want the most. It's just going to look different than what you thought. And if you can't see what he's doing, just ask for the eyes that you don't have that you might see what God sees. The first encouragement is that God is often actively engaged in the hidden the second thing is that when we're waiting, it often lifts up to the surface the things that we are blind to in our lives. You see, there are things that are often hidden in our hearts, and the weight, kind of, it's like a magnet, and it, it, it brings to the surface other things in our lives. So here I am, and I'm, 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 I'm praying for my siblings, I'm praying for my brother, and, and I want God to do something in his life. And what happens in me is there, there are parts of my heart that need further refinement and further conversion. Like, do I just believe in God's goodness? Do I believe in God's power? Do I believe that God has heard me? You know, it's easy for me to, to get up Sunday after Sunday and, 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 and exhort you, encourage you, and teach you. But there are parts of my own heart that, that he needs to speak to. And so as I'm waiting for miracles to happen in other people's lives, like what rises to the surface in my heart is pockets of my disbelief, and God wants to minister to that. So many times I have been praying for you, praying for my, my brothers and sisters, praying for people who ask me to pray for them. And as I'm interceding and as I'm waiting for God to answer that prayer, like things... God, God reveals things to me about me that need ministering to. So the second encouragement is as you're waiting, actually believe that God is actively involved in your life. And, and now the waiting has a purpose, doesn't it? It's got a meaning. And when waiting has a purpose and a meaning, then we can rest because we can now see that God is doing something and we can be engaged in receiving grace in that moment. Thirdly, in the wait, we are reminded that we can't grasp after the things that we long for. We have to receive them. Like, I can't force God's hand. I can't say enough prayers to finally convince God to hear me. I can't bargain with God or barter with God or, or buy off God. I can't uh, take on something that's not my responsibility. If you're still waiting for God to do something or to answer your prayer, it's not because you're doing something wrong. It's just because you're in a season. It could be because God's doing something, but like, don't believe the temptation that if you would just get this thing right, well, then this whole thing would just be better. Like, Don't believe that. That's not true. We have to receive from God. God, he wants to bless us. That's what we talked about four Sundays ago. But we have to let God give it to us how he wants to give it to us, when he wants to give it to us, and in the nature and the order of how he's going to give that to us. And so, yeah, like, the waiting refines, like, our lust-oriented kind of grasping in life and really just, like, it refines us to simply stay in a posture where God is God and we're not. So those three things can actually encourage us that God is, he is doing something and it could just be hidden or God, he's doing something to us and we just have to let him or he's, he's teaching us how to receive. Now you see now the weight, whew, now it has purpose and meaning and it's actually doing something in your life. So what's one thing that we can do this week? With all that as a big prelude, I just wanna encourage you to do one thing this week. Where are you waiting? And if you're waiting for someone or something, or if you're waiting in an answer to a prayer this week, what I'm going to encourage you to do is to take a moment this week and to surrender all of that to the Lord. Surrender all of your emotions. Surrender all of your expectations. Surrender any other judgments toward God or toward the process that may have built up in the waiting. Like this week, I'm going to encourage every one of us to take some time to actively surrender to God whatever has been there in our hearts during the wait. And imagine if we did that. Imagine if every one of us did that. If we came back next week as a people, as a family that were really free 
from any of the inordinate hooks that may have uh, like damaged us in the waiting. Like imagine if we were free to be with God in the wait. That's the kind of family I want to be a part of. I didn't know that that's what we want. I invite you to close your eyes for a second. Just close your eyes. Where are you waiting right now? Just pay attention to your heart. Like, what is God saying to you right now? What's he touching? Just in your own heart right now, just like tell God you surrender. Tell him, like just surrender to him all of the people, surrender to him all the emotions, all the expectations. Just right now, just give that to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we know that you're with us in the wait. Take the questions, take the burden, take the fatigue, take the people that we've been praying for and the deepest fears in our hearts. Just take everything, Lord. Fill it with your presence. Fill it with your intimacy. Bring us back to the truth of the 23rd Psalm that even though we walk through a dark valley that we fear nothing because you are with us. With your rod and your staff, you give us courage and strength. May St. Paul, who waited so beautifully, intercede for us today. May those in heaven who love us the most who know us so well, may they bless us with their intercession. And may Almighty God bless you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.